Welcome back young scholars. In this video we will be discussing decolonization. And so in this intro video we're about to watch, you will be able to see how the various European imperial powers like the British, the French, the Portuguese essentially imploded. And so keep track of the year in the corner and watch as the various colonies are going to achieve independence. So those bubbles represented the size of those various empires and you can see how as various territories were achieving independence, empires were shrinking dramatically. You'll note that most of the action that took place, most of the decolonization that occurred, occurred from the period of around 1947 following World War II till around 1980. So the big questions you should be able to answer after watching this video are what factors contributed to the dissolution of colonial empires following World War II? And how does India achieve independence from Great Britain? So what factors contributed to the dissolution of colonial empires following World War II? First of all, we need to understand the process of decolonization. So between the 1940s and the 1970s, former colonies in South Asia, right, like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh here, in Southeast Asia, like Vietnam, Laos, Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, the Middle East, including the ones that we saw with um, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, like Syria and Jordan, and in Africa, achieved independence. And this leads to the formation of what is our modern day map. So when we think back and throughout most of world history, the dominant political organizing force has been empire. But empire goes into a period of decline following World War One and World War Two, and ultimately what we're left with is the formation of a significant number of nation states. So what caused decolonization? A number of factors. First, the colonial powers, you know, like Great Britain, France, Germany, were weakened by World War One, by the Great Depression, by World War Two. We saw that sort of period of imperialism in period five when Europe was really achieving its sort of high watermark of, of global hegemony and global power. And then how at the beginning of period six, with World War One, with the Great Depression, and with World War Two, those European powers essentially engaged in actions of self-destruction. So that's one major factor. Those Europe European powers just simply weren't able to maintain a strong enough military to maintain control over the, their colonies. Second, though, there was this contradiction that had emerged after World War II that imperial powers became more cognizant of between the sort of Western Enlightenment ideals, right, of freedom and equality that were so essential to the revolutions that we learned about, like the American and the French Revolution, and imperialism as a policy, right? We, we discussed at the heart of imperialism were ideas of scientific racism, exploitation of colonies in order to extract wealth, in order to exploit labor. And so there was a recognition of that sort of hypocrisy, right? That we have certain ideals that we've set forth in documents like the Declaration of Independence in the United States and the Declaration of Rights of Man in France, and that we were not living up to 
and acting in furtherance of those ideals by engaging in imperialism. Now, how did we come to this conclusion? Well, really, World War II had to make it happen, right? And fighting against Nazi imperialism and fighting against Japanese imperialism in World War II, it became very clear that for those Western powers to say, well, we want to continue to maintain our colonies at the same time we're saying, oh, except Germany and Japan, you know, that you, you can't engage in imperial actions. And that, that hypocrisy became more clear. If we just focus, though, on Western powers, we're oftentimes forgetting the sort of agency of the colonists that were involved in fighting for and demanding um, independence. So nationalist movements sprouted up in various colonies, oftentimes led by educated leaders. And so we'll see the role that leaders like Mohandas Gandhi in India is going to play, Ho Chi Minh, we've already talked about him at length in Vietnam, Nelson Mandela in South Africa. And you can see one of the kind of unique characteristics of these leaders. We see here Gandhi wearing clothes that are traditional in nature. Same with Mandela, right? celebrating the pride in traditional African culture. A fourth factor that leads to decolonization is this Cold War, right? This is a period between 1945 and 1991 that we just said the Cold War influenced and touched everything. So ultimately, the Soviets in the United States, who were the global superpowers emerging from the Cold War, they were okay with nations achieving their independence. They believed both in both cases in self-determination. They advocated for that. However, I put a little asterisk next to it, right? As long as the new nation was on their side of the ideological struggle that was the Cold War. So as long as these newly independent nations were becoming, in the case of the United States, capitalists, or in the case of the Soviet Union, formed communist regimes. Both the, the global superpowers at the time were not engaged in imperialism really themselves, but instead supported this idea of self-determination. And we talked about how many of these newly independent nations were able to sort of play off both of these superpowers and form what's known as the non-aligned movement to try and stay neutral in this Cold War. So how did the process of decolonization take place? First of all, some of the colonies were able to negotiate their independence through more peaceful means. The example that we'll study in depth is the way in which India was able to, to gain their independence from Great Britain through a you know, relatively peaceful process. Other examples in West Africa, the French were willing to give up their West African colonies, and so the West Africans negotiated their independence. We'll discuss how Ghana and their leader at the time, Kwame Nkrumah, was able to negotiate their independence from the British. However, most of these colonies had to fight and struggle, and oftentimes they were long and protracted wars for independence that had to be fought. And so most colonies achieve their independence through some form of violent struggle. We've given a prime example already, which was Vietnam, and we talked about how the the people of what was originally called Indochina had to fight against first the French and then the Japanese in World War II and then the French again after World War II and then the Americans. I mean, there was a decades long struggle by the Vietnamese people led by Ho Chi Minh to try and ultimately achieve independence. Other examples that we'll, we'll look at um, in Kenya, there was an uprising by what is known as the Mau Mau, who were upset uh, with the way in which the whites were coming in and taking a lot of the farmland, and so they had to fight in order to achieve their independence, often through very violent, and even some might call it using terrorist tactics. We'll talk also about uh, Angola uh, briefly, and the way in which the Portuguese were really hanging on to the colony of Angola in central southern Africa. So... The first case study that we're going to look at when it comes to decolonization is India. How does India achieve its independence from Great Britain? First, some things we always have to keep in mind whenever we're discussing India. India is very diverse, right? Very diverse. And so there were a number of challenges that the Indians faced. First, whenever you're dealing with decolonization, you have to remove from power your colonizing nation. So in the case of India, it was the British. So the British had power in India from as far back as the British East India Company back in period four. 
And so the first major challenge was the sort of revolutionary part, right? Overthrowing and replacing the government. So one of the major challenges was getting rid of the British. But as we've seen in many cases, the revolution is sort of the easy part. The hard part then is being able to form a lasting and unified government. And that's going to be extremely difficult, especially in India, because again, the nature of that diversity. How do you, you know, bring together Hindus and Jains and Buddhists and Sikhs and Muslims um, and form a common national identity, right? We've talked about that challenge of nationalism before, especially in areas that are very diverse. India is linguistically diverse. It's um, religiously diverse. And so how do you promote unity among such diverse people was a significant challenge that was faced by India and in their quest for independence. So we talked about in period four in India, the British East India Company taking power from the Mughal Empire. And then in period five, we talked about how there, there was this major uprising against the British East India Company called the Sepoy Rebellion or the Indian Mutiny of 1857. And it was suppressed by the British and the British come in then and establish a period of direct rule over India from 1858 to 1947. So 90 years of rule by the British and that's known as the British Raj where the British were extracting resources like cotton and opium from India. Now some English educated Indian leaders in increasingly wanted to see Indians have a greater voice in their government, right? In the same way that happened in the United States, where some of the colonists felt like they weren't properly represented in the British Parliament. And so increasingly we see these leaders who had been educated oftentimes in Western schools, had learned about Enlightenment ideas and said, hey, wait a second, you know, we want power as well. And so in 1885, there's going to be a group um, that forms what's known as the Indian National Congress. It's a predominant political party that still to this day is very powerful in India. And the short name for that is the INC. So this is the situation that exists in India when World War I breaks out in 1914. And the British begin conscripting Indian soldiers, and we had talked about that, how they were drafting soldiers from their various colonies, and this leads to increased resentment towards the British, and so in response, the British impose laws that restricted Indians from meeting together. England is so powerful, its army and its navy, all its modern weapons. But when a great power like that strikes defenseless people, it shows its brutality, its own weakness, especially when those people do not strike back. But if we riot, if we fight back, we become the vandals and they become the law. If we bear their blows, they are the vandals. God and his law are on us. We must have the courage to take their anger. Battle the Major. Hello. So this event is known as the Amritsar Massacre. 1919 peaceful protesters are massacred uh, by the British and under the orders of General Reginald Dyer. 
And this is going to only increase public hostility towards British rule. And we'll see how that hostility will continue to manifest itself and eventually lead to independence in 1947. So thanks for watching.